good every good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to uh, many of you, and good evening for, to those in in uh, in Asia and Oceania. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the uh, fourth of our uh, AIB uh, JIBS uh, JIBP webinar series. Uh, today's topic uh, is on public policy and innovation. Uh, before we get started, and, and I hand over to uh, our moderator, just a, just a, a few points. Uh, as we go through the uh, different speakers, you have the opportunity to uh, ask questions through the Q&A function. Um, you can do that um, simply by typing in the question. Uh, if you like somebody's question, you think it's an important question, you can like that question, which will move it up the, the sequence of of uh, of uh, uh, order in terms of what it is that we see. Uh, and the moderator can then uh, direct the questions to specific um, panelists, or it can uh, direct them to uh, the panel at large. Uh, the seminar series, uh, as many of you know, uh, is uh, related to um, not just the AIB, but to uh, uh, the two journals, uh, the Journal of International Business Studies and the Journal of International Business. Uh, I'm the coordinator uh, of this, along with uh, Klaus Meyer. Klaus isn't um, with us today, but I'll be handling the coordinating. Um, and we'd just like to, again, thank um, AIB, thank the, the journals, Elaine and, and, and Sariana, uh, Ren Fei for doing the technology, and, and Tunga for making sure that everything gets organized and up and running. Um, we have three speakers uh today, uh, representing um, a, a plethora of uh, different co-authors, uh, Roger Strange from the University of Sussex, Nigel Driffield from Warwick Business School, and Shamin uh, Prashanatham uh, from SEEBS in, in Shanghai, although he's in India right now. Uh, uh, Arvan Osh uh, is going to handle the moderation today. Uh, so without much further ado, I'm going to turn over to Ari to introduce the papers and to uh, start the discussion. Thank you very much, um, uh, Tim, for the uh, introduction. Um, as a member of the uh, editorial team of the Journal of International Business Policy, um, I'm very excited that uh, today's fourth JIBS uh, JP webinar series um, is on uh, public policy and international business uh, research. Um, uh, so as uh, everybody knows, uh, one of the uh, aims of the Journal of International Business Policy is to provide a platform where uh, international business scholars, but also scholars of adjacent fields can take their theories, their frameworks, their concepts, um, and use them to address questions that are of key interest to uh, policy circles. Uh, so when Sayana and I sat down and we, we looked at what papers to include uh, in today's uh, webinar, we decided that they should follow two criteria. Uh, the first criteria was uh, that each and every paper should uh, take a topic that is uh, at the center of international business research, but that gives a twist uh, to uh, these uh, uh, topics by, by really looking at how they are relevant and important for uh, public policy. Um, and so you'll see later on how uh, every single paper has done this in, in a quite a, uh, innovative and, and, and a, a nice way. Uh, the second thing that we found was very important is that uh, all three papers should be part of a larger research theme in which we believe that international business scholarship can have a unique but also a lasting impact uh, on public policy discussions. And so if you, you look at the three papers that are um, going to be discussed later on, uh, you see that all three of them are looking at how uh, the fight for talent between uh, firms, the quest for knowledge, um, and the, the search for uh, creating intangibles uh, is something that is uh, of importance for public policy. Uh, so especially in today's uh, day and age where we are in a globalized knowledge economy, where we are seeing that uh, the share of value that is being created um, by knowledge intensive activities, uh, by intangibles uh, is um, uh, becoming more important, where we are seeing that um, intangibles are um, uh, increasingly important for dynamic capabilities, 
for firm specific um, uh, 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 advantages, but also in the strife that we're seeing between countries like uh, in the trade war between China and the United States, looking at this type of topic, but then thinking about the policy implications is something that we feel is very important. So without uh, going much further, I'd like to uh, start off by um, um, introducing the, uh, the, the, the first speaker. So uh, our first speaker is Nigel Driffield from the University of Warwick. Uh, he will present the paper, FDI in Hot Labor Markets, the Implications of the War for Talents, which is co-authored with Bettina Becker, uh, Sandra Lancheros, and uh, uh, Jim Love, uh, and which was published in the, uh, the second issue of this year in the Journal of International Business Policy. So I'll, I'll leave the, uh, the floor to uh, Nigel. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a particularly good initiative, particularly to try to reach out to, to people outside academia. Um, one of the, the interesting things actually um, is because this work was funded by the Research Council, that means there is money in the, there's been money in the budget to pay for this paper to be open access. So we did a, a little bit of promotion of the paper, but, but also connected with sort of people out there in the real world, as it were. And it's been interesting, the number of conversations that I've had, including with um, two cabinet ministers and two shadow cabinet ministers in the UK, who've kind of then seen the paper and been open to, to discussing some of the ideas in it, as well as people who work in the private sector in terms of advising firms on location decisions and than local inward investment promotion agencies. So, so I think it's it's good that we are we are reaching out in this way. Um, okay, so um, the purpose of this paper really is if you think about all of the, the models that we've used to try to get a handle on the, the labor market implications of FDI, particularly in host countries, they they all essentially start from the premise that one of the reasons that locations chase internationally mobile capital is as a solution to unemployment, that, that it's a way of generating jobs. Um, but what we've seen kind of really since, I suppose, since the, um, since the financial crisis is we're now seeing, particularly in the, in the developed world, we're seeing locations all chasing after the same high-tech FDI, that they're all after FDI in green technology, advanced manufacturing, automotive, R&D, pharmaceuticals. Everywhere in the world is chasing this stuff. And so we kind of thought, well, well what, what is that telling us about, about what we expect to go on here? That I've, I've written a number of papers over kind of, the last 20 years or so, looking at, for example, the extent to which wages are bid up because of inward investment uh, and what that then means for, for host countries. And so what we thought we'd do is say, right, OK, let's take these sectors that we know locations are really chasing internationally mobile capital in. And yet at the same time, they are the same sectors where we also know there are significant skill shortages. And even through the, some, of, some of the sectors that, that kind of we look at is even through the sort of the, the post financial crisis recession, when wages in the West have basically been flat, we still see year on year big increases in some of these sectors, because to be blunt, there is such a there's such a skill shortage. So one of the times I presented this paper as we were developing it. Somebody told me, for example, a story about how he um, works in a, a sort of an R&D lab in Massachusetts and loses people in the sandwich queue at lunchtime. That they, The sandwich trucks pull up, people go out, they start talking to the person in front of them in the queue and they get offered a different job. They go and resign and they move because such are the, the skill shortages. And, 
and we're kind of seeing that we're seeing that everywhere you know i i live right in the middle of the sort of uh, advanced manufacturing base of the west midlands and it is routine that firms take workers from their own suppliers for example you know because they have such skill shortages and they say yes we know that is by definition making our suppliers worse but such is the demand for talent so we kind of thought well if everybody's doing this what does this then tell us about the nature of the the labor market implications of this if we're all chasing the same stuff and firms are chasing the same sort of people what does that then tell us about all the models that we've developed to look at employment effects of fdi so what we basically do is relatively standard stuff. I'm not going to go through, the, through it in very much detail. But basically what we do is we've got two equations going on here. We've got kind of a labour cost or a wage equation and we've got employment equations. And what we're doing for a whole bunch of, if you like, high tech sectors is we are then trying to figure out whether an increase in foreign investment in a given location in a particular sector causes the sort of disequilibrium that anybody who works in this area is familiar with in terms of generating increased demand for employment, which pushes up wages, which then put pressures on to put pressure on domestic firms. So that's the, the basic premise here. So, so what we basically do is we've got a whole bunch of data for a whole bunch of basically European regions looking at high tech sectors. Um, and then one of the other things that we include, which is, I think, kind of novel in this research, is we also then include measures of labour market flexibility. For anybody who is at all interested in this, there's a, there's a really famous, utterly non-IB paper, but a really famous framework developed by Sapir for Europe, which looks at labour market flexibility and tries to explain labour market responses in different ways. And one of the reasons why we kind of think this is important is if you think about what, what labour market flexibility is meant to do, what that's meant to do is it's meant to mitigate shocks. And you could argue that particularly where the demand for, for skilled labour is very high and labour markets are overheating and we're seeing double digit increases in wages, that labour market flexibility ought to get round that. And at the same time, policymakers need to think about the sorts of FDI that they're trying to attract and why they're trying to attract it. So we kind of put those two things together and kind of took the old or the, the well-established international economics or labour economics approach to modelling the employment effects with FDI with if you read the paper, discussions around things like varieties of capitalism that would be familiar in an IB setting, but th seen through the lens of policies that um, then influence labour market flexibility. So again, sort of being parochial for a minute, I'm involved in all sorts of discussions, both within the UK, but also within European policy around what is essentially labelled as the productivity puzzle um, and the fact that why does, for example, the UK have lower productivity and lower productivity growth, say, than Germany or Denmark? Why, at the same time, do, does France have much higher levels of, of unemployment, say, than the UK or Ireland? And, and so one of, the, one of the lenses that I think kind of brings together policy and international business research is this idea of, of seeing labour markets or labour market flexibility as one of the things that we in IB label as institutions. So, for example, the UK is very, very good at getting people into jobs, but not very good at encouraging training. The, the labour market in France, for example, is very, very good at encouraging training and encouraging collaboration between employers and employees. But if you're outside of that sort of insider system, it's not very good at getting you into jobs. Um, and so we, we think that sort of understanding the, the labour market and how labour markets interact with international business, particularly in this, in this context of sort of... Um, 
of overheating labor markets and the demand for, for skills and skill shortages, we've kind of brought those two things together. So that's kind of the link to policy, I guess. So you can see there, what we've got is we've got a set of kind of high tech sectors, um, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, computers, so on and so on. So we're kind of deliberately focusing on the sort of high tech sectors and those sectors where they are permanently struggling for enough skilled staff, particularly in the West. OK, so what we basically do, I'm, I'm checking my watch. I'm not sure how long I've been going. Um, but what we basically then do is, is going back to the, the models that I talked about before. Um, we find no real sort of, sorry, I've just got stuff in my way. I can't actually see my slides. There we go. Um, overall, we kind of don't find very much in terms of an average effect of inward FDI on domestic employment. One of the things that, that we were concerned about is going back to some work I did kind of 20 years ago, is were we going to get big crowding out effects here? You know, that, that all that actually happens is foreign investment causes people to move in. It causes an increase in demand for labour. That increase in demand for labour means that small firms or local firms can no longer compete in terms of earnings. Uh, and we see a sort of shakeout, which, which essentially removes any of the benefits of attracting FDI. Um, but what we do find also is that, um, I've just spotted a spelling mistake, sorry. What we also find is that particularly for, say, transition, eco some transition economies in Europe, the increased presence of foreign firms does boost employment. So you can think of this, for example, in the context of spillovers, for example, that we kind of find that where labour markets are perhaps not as tight, say in transition economies, then foreign firms who come in, they do, they generate productivity growth, but they also generate employment in host country firms. So we kind of get this distinction between the old Western firms, where everybody's chasing skilled labour, and then the transition economies to the east of Europe, where the effects appear to be greater. Um, in, terms of, in terms of wages, we do, though, find that foreign investment causes wages to be bid up. OK, overall, taking everything together, roughly 10 percent increase in sales by foreign firms locally will generate about an 8 percent increase in unit labour costs. OK, that's a that's if you think about it, that's a really big effect. You know, we've got these we've got these competition effects for labour. We've got we've got a sort of strong, strong suggestion that there is a high elasticity of unit labour costs in response to foreign activity. OK, so long term, we have a suggestion then that this labour cost inflation may well be rendering the domestic sector uncompetitive. You know, and you can kind of you can kind of imagine this, as I say, this goes this goes back over a long time, but it's typically been focused on sort of um, less skilled workers that that the increase in demand basically is favouring skilled workers who see their wages bid up as the demand for them increases. OK, so what do we think this is telling us? Well, the first thing, which is where I started, really, is many locations are chasing the same types of investment. You know, they're seeking to develop comparative and competitive advantage in certain sectors, and they see inward investment as being a key element of that. Now, one public, public policy response, and this is the, the conversation that I have quite a lot sort of locally when I, I talk about this, is to my mind, and hey, I, you know, we would say this, we work in universities after all, most of us, that this place is education and training at the heart of the problem. That if we can find ways of alleviating skill shortages, then we can retain, if you like, the positive effects related to skill, spillovers, productivity growth, tech, innovation, technology, so on. But we can alleviate some of the negative effects in terms of the domestic sector becoming less competitive as it sees wages bid up. Nevertheless, 
we also see, we also know that skill shortages are going to get worse in the future. Um, this is something I kind of pose as a question because I know we've got we've got people from all over the world here. But this again is is a conversation I have with policymakers in the UK. One of the problems that the UK has in this space is money really doesn't go into training until a skill shortage becomes apparent. Whereas, you know, we would all say, well, what we would like to do is we'd like to say, OK, where are we looking at skill shortages in five years time? Well, let's put money into training in those sectors now. Whereas in the UK, and I think it largely it's, it's the case in a lot of European countries is because of the way that education and training policy is developed and it tends to be quite centralised. Is you have to wait until you've got a skill shortage before you can put in any money which of course means that you've got a significant time lag by the time you've trained the people at the other end. So, so skill shortages and how labour markets respond are important here. And the more training we have and the more skill provision we have, the more flexible labour markets will be. Um, at the same time, inward investment in these locations does create employment in high-tech innovative sectors but skills provision is needed to facilitate this. At an individual level, and this is, this is kind of the, the sort of statement of the obvious in some ways, at an individual level, the big winners from this process are always skilled labour. You know, it doesn't matter how you cut this, but when you have these sorts of processes, the more skilled you are, the better you will do. At a regional level, those locations that, for example, aligned to their colleges, their universities, their higher, higher technical high schools, and link the provision of skills to those required by internationally mobile investors, they are the regions that do best. Now, to, fl to flip that round and say, what does that mean for, for example, inward investment promotion agencies? It kind of means that, that skills provision needs to be at the heart of that. So, part of their value proposition for the world needs to not just be the set of assets that we have now, but the set of assets that we can create and we can create quickly through, um, through the creation of skills. Uh, and then just to, just to finish off, one of the, the things I find interesting about this is, uh, again, one of the discussions that I tend to have locally quite a lot is, um, and I, I apologise to the rest of the world for mentioning this, but in the context of Brexit, there are a lot of people in the UK who argue, who feel that because we have a very flexible labour market, we will always be an attractive location for inward investment compared with, say, some of continental Europe, which has less flexible labour markets. Uh, and to an extent, that may well be true. But that then raises the question is, what are those flexible labour markets doing for us? If all they are doing is encouraging people into relatively low wage jobs and it's they're very good at getting people into low wage activity rather than being unemployed, then that in itself might not be a bad thing. But it will not solve any of the problems that we have that firms face in terms of competing for very high tech, high skilled labour. And I think that was probably about my time, so I shall stop there. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, so um, we certainly have heard that the fight for talent is occurring in the British Midlands. Uh, the fight for talent is also happening in Montreal, but the fight for talent is also happening uh, in countries like uh, China, Vietnam, uh, other countries as well. Um, you have many of these countries that are putting in place policies to attract foreign direct investment. And so one of the questions is whether or not uh, these countries are able to, uh, as a result, catch up rapidly um, uh, in these knowledge intensive activities. And that leads to the second paper, uh, our second speaker, um, who is uh, Roger Strange from the University of Sussex. He will present uh, the paper Catching Up in the Global Factory, Analysis and Policy Implications. Uh, and the paper is co-authored with Peter Buckley, uh, Marcel Timmer and uh, Geitsen de Vries. Uh, it also came out in the second issue of Journal of International Business Policy this year. The floor is your, uh, yours, uh, Roger. Okay, thank you.
Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this, this webinar and thank you to, to Tim, Klaus and Ari for the invitation. Um, as you can see, this is a paper with, with four authors. Peter Buckley, of course, needs no um, introduction to this particular audience. Marcel and Hyatson are both economists from Groningen University. I can't. Sorry, let me get trouble. Um, now, the genesis of this paper, as, as I refer to it, was um, two papers that, on the one hand, Marcel and Hyatson and their, their colleagues in Groningen wrote a few years ago and published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. A very nice paper, very well-written paper called Slicing Up Global Value Chains. And about the same time, Peter and I were working on a paper which we had published in the Academy of Management Perspectives on the the global factory and we became aware of each other's work and realized that we were perspectives and so we decided that yes why not get together and do some, some work um, and this is where this paper comes from and basically our paper I guess is inspired by by these sort of four uh, four previous examples of previous literature Firstly, there's Peter's work, conceptual work on the global factory. Um, he's published this in numerous places, notably in jibs with, with Pervez Gary back in 2004. Secondly, there's a, a very nice book by Richard Baldwin talking about the great convergence and particularly about how advanced economies and emerging economies, income levels are in a process of convergence. And Richard Baldwin sees this as a process which is again nearing its conclusion. Alongside that there's a series of papers by Danny Roderick on unconditional convergence and his thesis is that the, this convergence, this process of convergence is presently limited by the scale of manufacturing in emerging economies but that as the scale grows then productivity will follow and convergence will follow alongside that. And last but not least We've seen a number of sort of product level studies, um, and I'm citing just two of them there, which are looking at individual products, the global value chains for individual products, and looking at the kinds of jobs and where the different kinds of jobs are located, fabrication jobs more in emerging economies, more knowledge intensive jobs in more advanced economies, and how tracking not just where the jobs are, but where income is going. So inspired by these four pieces of work, all these four threads of the literature, uh, we decided we work together and we'd try and look at where link, uh, labor incomes are generated within the global value chains of manufactured goods. And we're trying to distinguish in our analysis between fabrication activities and knowledge intensive activities. And here's a schematic diagram, a very sort of familiar one to most of us of a global value chain showing that Knowledge intensive workers and fabrication workers are involved in country A to produce intermediate inputs, which then go to the next stage in the value chain in country B. Again, more inputs from knowledge intensive workers and from fabrication workers passed on to, to country A and eventually ending up with the, the final assembly. And at each stage in this process, even though it, it spills over a number of different countries, there's inputs from different kinds of workers and, and at our level of aggregation we're just distinguishing fabrication workers and knowledge intensive workers. And so what we're trying to do in this paper is to look at the convergence process. Certainly we all know that we look at the world economy it's very clear that if you like the, the shift in the, the focus of activity of particularly manufacturing activity has gone towards the emerging economies. And there's been a, a, de a degree of deindustrialization in advanced economies. But we want to look at, decompose that a little bit, see how this process of convergence can be broken down into uh, looking at the scale of involvement in the global factory where income is going to, how different countries are specializing in particularly knowledge intensive activities and looking at productivity differences. And again, questioning some of the assumptions of Baldwin and Roderick that 
sort of technology diffusion and, and catch up is often a fairly quick process. And I think we as IB scholars, we have a lot of literature which tells us that that isn't the case, that there are time lags involved in, in organizational learning, there are constraints involved in acquiring advanced technology, and many emerging economies have got weak uh, institutional environments, weak national innovation systems, which slow down this process of catch up. Now our empirical analysis um, draws on two sources. One is the world input output database, which is a database looking at the entire world and looking at the linkages in global value chains between different sectors. And this database identifies 56 industrial sectors. It separately identifies 40 economies, and it's looking at all the linkages, the input output linkages between these sectors and these economies. And there's a big rest of the world um, economy in there as well. Then there's the occupations database, which enables us to distinguish between fabrication activities and knowledge intensive activities. And we have data over a 20 year period from 1995 to 2014. Unfortunately, and I'll come back to this point, that's the latest data that we have available. Um, and of course, from a sort of policy perspective, this isn't ideal if the latest data you have is six years old. Now, just to give a flavor of our results, obviously haven't got too much time here. Here's one of the, the, the figures in our, in our paper. Along the horizontal axis, you've got the change in global factory income and how this has changed over that 20 year period, 1995 to 2014. And so, for example, the right hand side of this diagram, you've got China. We see that China has quadrupled the income it's getting from the global factory over that period. India, the income it's getting from the global factory has gone up three and a half times. On the vertical axis, we're looking at the change in the share of knowledge intensive activities within manufacturing global value chains. And here we see, of course, America, not much growth in the, 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 the size of their contribution to the global factory, but quite a significant change in their, their specialization. They've moved out of fabrication activities into more knowledge intensive activities. And we all know of company examples, Apple being the obvious one, where the, the more basic assembly activities, fabrication activities have been offshored. And meanwhile, the, the firms themselves have been concentrating more on the design, the pre-production, the high value added activities. Japan, we see there too, the size of these bubbles, the size of these circles reflects the size of the economies. And so, yes, we see China and India, the right hand side of the diagram, you can see Brazil tucked in there, both with a, a, a chain, change in scale and also interesting, a change in specialization towards knowledge intensive activities. The US, very much a change in, in specialization, Japan too. Unfortunately, as, as a British person, you can see right down there with the Y and X axis cro axes cross, there's Britain. So our sort of overall income from the global factory stayed much the same, but also we haven't moved very much in terms of greater specialization in knowledge intensive activities. A second, act, uh, second um, figure, just to again, give you a flavor of our results. This is a diagram looking at the extent of convergence over time. So up the vertical axis, you've got income per capita in emerging economies as, a, as a, a fraction of income per capita in the advanced economies. And again, how this has changed over our 20 year period. And you see for fabrication activities, there have been quite a significant degree of, of convergence, moving from just about 20% up to almost 60%. But in terms of knowledge intensive activities and the income generated there, a much slower process of convergence moving from about 15% up to about 30%. It's happening, but it's happening much slower. So our conclusions, just to wrap up, this convergence process that Richard Baldwin and Danny Roderick are talking about, it's far from complete, at least in 2014, which is the latest data that, that we have. 
obviously in 2020, things have moved on and it'd be really good to have data, more recent data. So there's been a strong increase in the scale of fabrication activities in many emerging economies, but much less in terms of knowledge intensive activities. And productivity levels in those emerging economies, much lower than productivity levels in, in uh, advanced economies, both in terms of fabrication and in terms of knowledge intensive activities. Where can we take this kind of analysis further? Um, one might be looking at the role of lead firms in how they govern and distribute value within their value chains. Second uh, avenue might be our analysis has looked at labour incomes, but maybe we ought to be looking at capital incomes as well. Uh, and there's quite a lot of literature out there saying that when we look at the world economy, that the share taken by labour has been decreasing, whereas the share taken by capital has been increasing and how that plays out in different countries. The third avenue, and this is something that the four of us are starting to work on, is looking at the increasing importance of intangible capital, such as intellectual property, branding and databases and such things, and how we can sort of what effect these are having. And lastly, we've looked at manufacturing global value chains. And yes, there are service inputs to manufacturing global value chains, but we also ought to look at service global value chains and maybe when we're focusing on advanced manufacturing countries that would be very important last bullet point there is a yes just uh, mentioning again the fact that our last version of the database is for 2014 it would be great to have an up-to-date version of this database implications for public policy on innovation which is the the, the the topic of this webinar global value chains by definition are global they're dynamic and this means by definition it's difficult for national policy makers to control what's going on and this of course is ever more the case in 2020 with let's just just refer to it as geopolitical disputes around the world uh, and, and the sustainability and the resilience of global value chains are very much up in the air at the moment for advanced market economies very much policy should focus on investing high in higher value added knowledge intensive activities, picking up here on one of Nigel's conclusions. For emerging economies, it's to emphasize that probably this, proce this process of convergence isn't inevitable, isn't just going to happen. Um, you've got to work at it. You've got to bring in new technology, you've got to develop your own indigenous innovation capabilities, and it's about developing, improving your business environment, improving your national innovation systems. So there are echoes here, I think, of what Nigel was saying in, in the first presentation. That's, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, uh, so I think there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff here uh, indicating that developed countries continue to specialize in knowledge intensive activities. And as a result, there is a limited convergence of um, developing countries in their share of income related to um, knowledge intensive activities. Um, if anybody has questions to, to ask about it, of course, you can ask questions in the question and answer period. Um, uh, I'd like to go now to the, the third paper. So what we have is um, developed countries specializing in uh, knowledge intensive activities, but within developed countries, you also have the, the big cities that generally speaking are uh, the ones that also specialize in these knowledge intensive activities. So the question then is, what about peripheral regions? Um, does no knowledge not matter there? Does it matter a lot? How does it matter? So this is a question that um, uh, Shamin Prashantam um, addresses in his paper, uh, which is ME SME co-innovation in peripheral regions, which is co-authored with Sumelika Bhattacharyan, and which also came out in the second issue of Dur Journal of International Business Policy uh, this year. So I'll, I'll leave you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ari. Let me begin to share my screen. Um, hopefully you can all see it. Um, well, uh, I'm delighted to be part of this webinar. Many thanks to Ari for the invitation uh, and to Tim and Klaus for their leadership of this initiative. Uh, this paper methodologically is in uh, 
a, a sort of drastic contrast to the two papers you've heard so far, which I found extremely interesting. This is an exploratory qualitative study, uh, as Ari said, trying to uh, understand what happens outside of the big clusters that tends to be the focus of a lot of research uh, in terms of innovation. Uh, collaborative innovative activity involving multinational companies uh, through their subsidiaries uh, and host market firms has been an area for a long time that has interested uh, international business scholars, both those with more of a strategy orientation and, and those with more of an interest in public policy. Um, a bit like Roger, um, there is also sort of an underpinning uh, paper, some work with Peter Buckley, which coincidentally also appeared in the Academy of Management Perspectives, uh, looking at uh, the division of entrepreneurial labor between uh, MNEs and SMEs in the context of the global factory. And taking that as sort of a building block, what uh, I've been trying to explore in this paper along with a former doctoral student, Sumelika, is uh, whereas most of the work quite understandably in terms of MNEs and smaller companies working together tends to focus on the large uh, high reputation clusters, both in advanced and emerging economies. So Silicon Valley, for example, or the Thames Valley region, um, including London, uh, or Bangalore and uh, Zhongwan Sun in uh, China, for example. What about the uh, peripheral non-cluster context? And while the bulk of innovative activity probably takes place in clusters, it's not as if innovation is absent in peripheral re uh, regions involving many subsidiaries for at least a couple of re reasons. Now, in some cases, uh, there are um, robust efforts being made by policymakers to attract inward foreign direct investment. And so there are incentives for multinational enterprises to consider peripheral regions as a location for subsidiaries. But there are also historically operational, very often manufacturing focused subsidiaries that over time might seek to improve their performance to do which they need to get a bigger mandate from the parent for which they need to demonstrate ability to be uh, to perform uh, innovation activities, and therefore they seek to work with local uh, smaller firms. And so the research question is: How is MNE SME collaboration for innovation enabled in peripheral subnational regions? Uh, and the overarching argument is that, in contrast to high reputation clusters like Silicon Valley or Bangalore, where these kinds of collaborations tend to happen spontaneously, uh, the role of policy is extremely important, uh, particularly in peripheral regions. And in fact, what we're seeing is that policy makers are themselves entrepreneurial in these initiatives that we study. As I said, this is very explorative, it's qualitative, uh, and it entails two major case studies. Um, we did about uh, 25 to 30 interviews in each, so fairly detailed work uh, in the UK as well as China. Uh, in the UK, this was a Scottish initiative called Scottish Technology and Collaboration that, that was driven by Scottish Enterprise out of Glasgow. Uh, and in China, it was the smart city program in the city of Ningbo uh, in Zhejiang province, uh, which uh, sought to, to bring together uh, these very disparate entities. Now, doing comparative research uh, of this nature is, um, is, is a very imperfect uh, science. It's nigh impossible to get um, uh, you know, perfect comparators. But we were looking for three things. We wanted research sites where attracting FDI was being pursued very ac actively, where the effort to enable the, the multinational companies from abroad to work with local smaller companies was intentional, uh, and also um, to see that uh, there was some entrepreneurial effort being made uh, by the uh, policymakers that were involved. 
Uh, and so what I'm going to do is go straight into the conceptual model. I'm not going to spend any time on the uh, methodology. Uh, there, there are details of that, including the coding and so on in the paper. But broadly speaking, the central finding was that in both cases, you had what we describe as boundary work uh, being carried out by the policymakers as they sought to bring together the multinationals and the local smaller companies. And this boundary work in both cases, uh, we identified three sub-processes. Uh, the first we call sensing. This is more about the recognition of the opportunity for these disparate entities to work together. The second is interfacing, which is sort of the intermediation activity to actually broker the relationships. And the third was co-creating, which was uh, enabling joint value creation. However, the way in which these three processes were carried out varied uh, dramatically. And I'm going to start uh, with the bottom of the figure with the Scottish example. Uh, Scott, the Scottish example was, uh, as I'd mentioned, uh, called STAC, this policy initiative, Scottish Technology and Collaboration. And the way this began was uh, multinational subsidiaries such as Sun Microsystems uh, Scotland or IBM Scotland put forward a suggestion to Scottish Enterprise that they were seeking to now do more innovative work because the manufacturing was going east to Central and Eastern Europe, further afield. They wanted to be able to upgrade their capabilities and get uh, more work uh, pertaining to innovation from the parent companies. Uh, and would it be possible for them to help them to identify and work with suitable smaller local companies? And then when Scottish Enterprise um, basically uh, inquired with its other constituents, like the smaller companies, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And so first of all, in terms of sensing, it was other initiated, meaning not by the policymakers themselves, but they were responding to a need that they felt. And then in terms of interfacing, essentially, uh, Stack was a was sought to act as an honest broker high level of transparency. So they laid out very clear criteria as to what sort of SME partners were being sought by the multinationals, which multinationals were interested. So in the case of Sun Microsystems, for example, 250 SMEs applied, three were, were shortlisted in the end to work on joint projects in a very clear process that uh, basically um, matched uh, the, the two sets of partners in terms of compatibility, in terms of technology, uh, and so on. And once these companies were bought, brought together, what the Scottish Enterprise team or that specific initiative team, the stack team did was basically to then let the companies get on with it and uh, co-create a solution. So, so the typical output was Sun Microsystems or IBM would provide their hardware expertise and work with local software companies, and then they would jointly come up with a new product prototype. And so in that sense, it was very bottom up. Now, if you take that as sort of, a, of, of the default approach that one would expect policymakers to take based on the, the literature, which is largely based on Western uh, context, liberal democracies, uh, it's rather interesting to see a, a contrasting approach from uh, the policymakers in Ningbo, who also were quite intentional in trying to help their local smaller firms have the opportunity to work with larger multinationals. But unlike in Scotland, which had had multinational subsidiaries around for four or five decades and were basically trying to help them upgrade, in Ningbo, task number one was to attract the multinationals and actually have subsidiaries that could partner with the local uh, smaller companies uh, while, at the, while uh, suffering from the handicap of not being seen as a high reputation cluster such as Hangzhou, for example, which, was the, the, which is the province capital. And so the initiation came from themselves. They recognized this opportunity. And the way in which they went about this was in contrast to Scotland, use an existing generic policy program, namely the smart city program, which pretty much every city in China has. But the way they went about this was 
rather different. Uh, in contrast to other cities which have hundreds, if not thousands, of smart city projects involving various companies, the Nimbo Smart City um, Department took the entire smart city pie and split it up into a small number of sizable chunks. They started with smart logistics because Nimbo has a big port, uh, but they also had a smart health, smart transport, smart manufacturing, smart healthcare. And they gave, so there were two parts to this. The first was they said that the contract for each of these sizable slices would be given to only one company. And so that way they were able to attract the interest of large companies. The first contract to be awarded was for smart logistics. IBM got the, co the contract. Uh, and so one of their youngest subsidiaries is actually a small R&D center in Nimbo, which is in contrast to their subsidiary in Greenock in Scotland, which is one of their oldest. Um, but the other part of the cunning plan was uh, the Nimbo smart city government knew that no single company could actually deliver the entire project by themselves. They would have to work with local companies that had the expertise to actually implement the solutions. And the vast majority of these were smaller companies. And so this, in, in this way, uh, the, um, well, this was the plan and it worked uh, in the sense that IBM showed up uh, and uh, now. In t the next step in terms of interfacing, as opposed to the Scottish approach, which was very facilitative, very transparent, in the Nimbo case, it was very directive. And step one of that process was they initiated or instigated uh, the setting up of a new private uh, new venture, ostensibly private, uh, but their mandate was to work closely with IBM on delivering solutions for smarter logistics. And uh, that new venture also became an interface between IBM and Nimbo and other local startups. Um, of course, uh, the, company, the, the government officials would not tell IBM who they should or shouldn't work with, but there were subtle hints and introductions made by government officials, which led to some opportunities for some rather small startups to do some interesting work with IBM. And finally, in terms of co-creating this uh, uh, solution for uh, the Nimbo Smart City project, uh, as I said, it was uh, top, uh, you know, the, the, the government officials were quite directive in terms of what they wanted. And to that extent, it was top down, but resulted in, in very good work. And it was clear that IBM had got the, the, the message as well, because some of the quotes we have in the paper, uh, are, you know, go along the lines of, we could see very clearly what the local government strategy was, and we aligned ourselves with it. But the end result, not unlike Scotland, was also high quality innovation, so much so that not only was a prototype for a smart logistics solution showcased widely in the province, but also one of the highest ranking officials of IBM flew down from uh, the United States uh, to witness the, um, uh, the demonstration of that solution. And I was lucky to be able to observe this. Synthesizing the two broad approaches, in terms of the advanced economy approach, it seemed to be more of uh, an approach of opportunity discovery, whereas in the case of the emerging economy, more of opportunity creation. In the advanced economy, more of a bottom-up approach in the, um, in the example from China, more of a top-down approach. And I've, I've uh, compressed a lot of information in, in, a, in a very limited amount of time. There's much more rich detail in the paper. But hopefully by looking at these two exploratory case studies, we do provide some stimulus uh, for future research. We hope we extend the literature, first of all, in terms of the phenomenon of large companies and small companies working together. The paper I referred to with Peter Buckley about the division of entrepreneurial labor. And in a sense, this uh, broadens the picture to highlight the role of non-market actors like policymakers, particularly in peripheral regions. In terms of policy intervention in peripheral regions, it sheds light on what you might think of as micro foundations, the entrepreneurial actions of these uh, policy makers in terms of boundary work, which underpins, if you will, a regional dynamic capability 
to borrow the phrase from Yema Reno. Uh, and in terms of also understanding how things might differ across emerging and advanced economies, the advanced economy approach in Scotland was a bespoke approach, whereas in China, one might think of it as a bricolage approach, making do with what one has. They didn't start uh, trying to create a new policy measure, but they used a generic one, smart city programs, uh, in a rather creative way to uh, deliver this uh, uh, outcome of young companies, smaller companies with it, that were in the local milieu having the chance to work with a large, highly reputed company like IBM. Um, going uh, forward in terms of future research, uh, as I say, this is very quali uh, exploratory, qualitative work. Uh, large-scale work in the future to confirm some of these ideas would be very welcome. But also longitudinal studies to see how milliers may mature and how this may affect uh, the cognitive perspectives of the actors involved, including uh, policy makers. Also, we use the term SME uh, both in the paper with Peter as well as here. And, you know, talking to policy makers, they too often use that term. But uh, truth be told, in both of these cases, many of these SMEs were actually rather young startups, which is not uncommon in the technology sectors we were looking at. But in, in some other cases, there are more mature, older SMEs that work with MNEs. And so contrasting how these, um, uh, these different sets of small companies work with multinationals when policy measures are put in place could be interesting. Uh, there are clearly implications for capability upgrading, which resonates with, with Roger's work with Peter as well. Uh, and finally, I also want to draw attention to the prospect that particularly in peripheral regions and perhaps even more so um, in the light of what has happened with the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic distress under which now many actors will be operating uh, in the foreseeable future uh, will be the importance of promoting the sustainable development goals. The importance of which has only increased, I think, with what has been going on with the pandemic, but in some, in some ways the, the difficulty is also going to increase. And this is something we touch upon in a paper with Julian in Julian Birkinshaw in Journal of International Business Studies. Uh, and I just want to uh, encourage uh, all of us to continue to think about how uh, international business scholars can contribute towards a better understanding in this decade ahead as we look ahead to 2030 about how we can accomplish the SDGs. And I think uh, cooperation between large multinationals and SMEs can be one important contributor to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shamin. So we're going to move now to the uh, question and answer period. We have about 12 minutes uh, for this. There is a first question by Mike Murphy uh, about um, what might be uh, preventing uh, convergence in knowledge intensive activities um, uh, uh, in developing countries. Is it that certain knowledge intensive activities have become labor intensive and that uh, countries like India or China are taking that over, um, but because they now get relabeled, that this is um, stopping convergence from happening. So if you can give some insights in, in what might be preventing convergence, that would be much appreciated. Is that directed at me? Sorry, to Roger, yes. No. yes. <laughs> um, well, yes, I, I, I think there's an, a number of factors delaying convergence. O obviously, we see that in India, in China, in many emerging economies, that there has been a lot of knowledge intensive activities uh, growing, particularly over the last sort of five, six years since, unfortunately, the, our data set, since the, the time that our data set was produced. Um, but yes, it, 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 I think it's partly because those knowledge intensive activities need a base to build upon. It needs a, a fabrication and manufacturing base to build upon. There are also time lags in terms of absorptive capacity, developing the skills required to, to provide those knowledge intensive activities uh, and, and, and having a, a, an institutional environment and a, 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 a an innovation system, which again picks up on some of the comments that Nigel was making, that supports knowledge intensive activities, that provides the, the labor force and everything that goes with it that's going to permit that to happen. Um, 
and so yes it's happening it, and and if if we have the data for 2020 i'm sure those diagrams i was putting up showing a degree of convergence would be much more dramatic and as we go into the future even more so um, some of the analysis that we do in the paper suggests that convergence in knowledge intensive activities tends to follow on with about a five year lag behind convergence in fabrication activities, which for all the reasons I was talking about seems about right. So yes, if, we, if we're extrapolating forward to, to well, from here, to, from 2014 to 2020 on to 2025 to 2030, I'm saying it's highly likely that this process of convergence will have moved on considerably. Thank you very much. I have another question here that is a, a more general question, um, but I will address it to Nigel to start off with. Uh, uh, so this is more a question about what international business policy is. Aren't, so this is a question by Taras Dankum. Aren't we stepping here into the realms of international economics and macroeconomics, losing our international business core? Uh, do you feel that um, there is a space for something that is special, which is international business policy? What is the red line? Okay, I mean, I think the easiest way I would answer the easiest way I would I would say of answering that is let's turn it round and think about this from the perspective of somebody who is running a let's say let's think of a U.S. context. You're running the investment promotion agency for your state governor. Okay, and so the state governor has a series of asks of you, one of which is find some jobs for here, the two unemployed people, but another one is um, Rick, get me, you know, we need to improve our productivity. We need to improve, as Roger just said, the innovation system. Okay, so go out and find me some investors who will do that. Or you can think about this in the context of Asian countries doing the same thing. So the first thing then I would argue that that person needs to understand is what's our value proposition to the world? That's, after all, what, in, what investment promotion agencies do. They are the, they, they sort of, if you like, are the bridge between the comparative advantage or the location advantage that a place has and the stock of potential inward investors. And so the first thing they therefore then need to do is they need to understand what firms are interested in and what strategy firms are thinking about. So we need, so we, as I sit in the middle and I do quite a lot of this, I work with firms on, on their location decisions. I also work with inward investment agencies in terms of attracting it. And so I say to one side, well, you need to understand what the firm's strategy is because the better you can understand that, the better you can explain your value proposition in terms of you adding value to the business. On the other side, I say to firms, you need to understand the politics of this, you need to understand what the governor is after and how well you can then say to the governor, well, if you are able to give me this tax break or whatever it is, I can generate you this many jobs, this much technology, this many, this productivity gain, whatever it is. And so I see, I see people like me sitting in the middle of that. Yes, I write academic papers, but I try and bring those two things together. Um, I've never been considered a macroeconomist. I have, however, been considered an international economist. Thank you. Any comments, Roger or Shamin? Well, yes, I, I, I think international business, international economics are, are very complementary. Um, and it would be a mis um, Is there a red line? Don't quite know that, uh, how to answer that. I think international business, uh, our focus is generally on firms. Maybe to global value chains, we're looking at firm strategies, um, why firms do things, how they, uh, whether they offshore activities, whether they internalize or externalize activities, uh, how they coordinate those activities and looking in how firms do that. Whereas international economics tends to be more looking at things from a, a country point of view, a sectoral point of view, and firms are, in one sense, incidental in this. They're, they're the, Certainly they're the actors, but you're looking at the aggregate effect. And here I'm kind of, again, echoing what Nigel was saying. So, yes, you know, if, if we think about foreign direct investment, which is very much what, what we, you know, one of the themes in international business. Yes, we like to explain why firms undertake foreign direct investment. And 
But yes, the economists very much look at the effects of that on local economies. And as Nigel has been talking about how economies, local economies, host economies can attract foreign direct investment for the potential benefits that it brings. Um, we might also, there's overlap with you know, political scientists and development scholars who might look at the, the negative effects that foreign direct investment has. Um, and all, all too often, I think we, we sit in our silos and we don't reach out to, to other disciplines which are looking at the same phenomenon, phenomena as we are, but they're looking at it from different perspectives. And, and just coming back to the sort of paper that I've just presented, I found it incredibly interesting to work with two economists who are used to that macroeconomic perspective and me as a, an international business person with my sort of interest in firm strategy. Um, so I don't see red lines, in, if, and if there are red lines there, I'd encourage everybody to rub them out and, and to read literature in these other disciplines and to try and work with people in these other disciplines as well. Thank you very much. So I'll have a last question that I'll um, uh, indicate to Shamin. Uh, so uh, right now we are living in a period of COVID-19 where we're doing the opposite of connecting. We are uh, in lockdowns where we have to stay two meters away from each other, where people are working from home, non-essential travel is uh, difficult. Do you have any thoughts based on your paper? What might be the impact of um, uh, COVID-19 if it would go on in the long run for innovation uh, and for partnerships between SMEs and SMEs in peripheral regions? Oh, that's a, such a good question. Uh, actually, um, I've been doing a little bit of um, research during these past two, three months about cases of, of large companies and smaller companies working together to address new opportunities arising because of COVID-19. And uh, one of the most interesting initiatives I came across is called Startups Against Corona, uh, which is um, initiated by the former co-founders of the BMW Startup Garage, which, was BM, which is BMW's uh, startup partnering initiative. Um, and uh, Gregor Gimme and uh, Dr. Matthias Mayer, who started that program, have, have since left BMW. Uh, and one of the things they're doing is, is actively bringing together smaller companies working with large companies. And one interesting outcome of this was a startup from Pune, India, uh, ended up working with uh, this large um, cement company in Switzerland, Lafarge Holson, uh, to address remote work management in the Latin American operations of that large uh, Swiss company. Um, now, um, Ram Udambi will probably say Pune is a big cluster. Uh, if you look at it from a Bangalore perspective, it's not the most uh, spectacularly cluster-like location, but irrespective, I mean, it just goes to show uh, that uh, thanks to digital communication and uh, this massive digital transformation that's happening, it is possible to make these connections. And I think um, where you find that the smaller company has been able to recognize new opportunities and pivot rapidly, and also where the big companies have pre-COVID develop the mindset that they should be looking for innovation uh, in, in outside of the boundaries of the company. But also, I think the third crucial piece is what these individuals that, who worked for BMW before bring to the picture, which is expertise in interfacing. Uh, because on the one hand, on paper, there are very complementary capabilities between the big company and the small company. But in reality, when they start working together, it becomes, it's not straightforward to, to make these um, uh, complementary capabilities come together. This was part of what we were looking at with uh, Peter Buckley in the, in, in the AMK paper. And in the paper I presented, what we were trying to show is in peripheral regions, policymakers may have to help with this interfacing role. But uh, I'm optimistic that there are these opportunities, that it is happening, uh, but the expertise to bring these different sets of firms together is important. Uh, and also investments in social capital that happened prior to the crisis uh, are clearly paying off. And I'm, I'm seeing those sets of companies like that Swiss cement company that already had invested in efforts to understand smaller companies, better place to do that. And I hope we will see more examples of that um, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I can't believe we're already running out of time. So um, uh, I'm actually going to pass on the uh, uh, the screen to Tim, who's going to uh, finish with uh, some uh, wrapping and uh, a discussion of key insights. But I would like to thank um, uh, all three of you profoundly for uh, your presentation, your excellent contribution uh, to the Journal of International Business Policy. Um, it's uh, much appreciated. Tim? Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, is also to let everybody know that um, the video will be available um, on the AIB website. Um, and in addition, uh, you will be able to get the slides on that site. Uh, the video itself will, is, is also available um, literally immediately along with the other webinar vi videos on, on the YouTube channel associated with the webinar series. Um, I'd also like to, to, to thank uh, Nigel, Roger, and Shamin, um, as well as Ari, for uh, an excellent session. Uh, just to conclude, uh, if, if, you, uh, if you can uh, see on my screen in just a second, as soon as I can share it, um, is the uh, next set of, uh, of, uh, of, of seminars. Uh, which was the AIB conference um, from July 2nd through July 5th. Um, the presenters will be um, all of us in some sense. Uh, it'll be the entire community. Uh, so we won't be having a, a, another webinar until after the AIB conference. Uh, there will probably be two webinars in July, um, the last two weeks of July, most likely. Um, one is currently being uh, worked on now. The other one is already scheduled, which you can see there, the 30th of July, um, a slightly different uh, 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 approach rather than talking about papers. Um, we're going to do a retrospective um, on Oliver Williamson's influence on international business. Uh, the uh, moderator is going to be Peter Klein, uh, with the speakers being uh, Jean-Francois Henner, Joanne Oxley, David Teese, and Elaine Rebecca. Uh, and the... Most of us know that, you know, uh, Oliver Williamson didn't write a lot, directly speaking, um, uh, himself about multinationals and international business. But his work is usually influential across the field um, in terms of being utilized and cited. Um, and we felt that it was kind of appropriate to uh, um, do a bit of a, a retrospective given his, his, recent, uh, his recent death. Um, so uh, you will soon be able to register for the 30th of July uh, webinar and most likely uh, another one in July. And uh, we expect probably uh, two uh, more in, uh, in August following um, the Academy Management Conference. So with that, I'd like to thank all the speakers, I'd like to thank you for participating um, and your patience in listening. And uh, everybody have a good evening or good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone. So thank you and uh, goodbye.